Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We have interesting conversations with insightful people about how to apply behavioral sciences to work and life. In this episode, we spoke with Sam Tatum, the Behavioral Strategy Director at Ogilvy in London. Sam guides his clients through the uncharted waters of developing new ways to manage all sorts of behavioral issues with their employees and their customers. We first met Sam at a conference in San Francisco where he wowed us, or at least Tim, with his presentation on how applying behavioral science was like writing a song. Oh, come on. You were impressed, too. I was impressed, and I was very impressed then when he even made references to Jimi Hendrix, which I think just knocked you out of your seat. (laughs) It did. And we knew that we wanted to meet this guy and have him as a guest on our podcast, and we were very, very glad that he said yes. Uh Very true. It turned out that this Aussie living in London was interested in behavioral science from a very early age and even considered studying clinical psychology in college. Uh, Well, either psychology or graphic design. Which are two great things. I mean, that's my employee Ben's background. So, you know, good for that. Early in his career, Sam worked in a number of different jobs, from a crisis center to beer marketing. What a great job. In each of these jobs, Sam had to understand the human dynamic to be successful, particularly as it relates to asking the right types of questions. This got Sam thinking about how asking consumers the right types of questions could impact the data that they gathered. He's like a Socrates in the 21st century. I love that. He is also interested in good solutions. And in a terrific story about leveraging social proof in a factory, Sam told us about a company's factory workers that were not thoroughly washing their hands, even with lots of reminders. So their solution struck at the core of having clean hands, and that is our inability to see germs. So with the application of a simple and inexpensive organic ink stamp, immediately before each employee started their shift, it became clear who did and who didn't wash their hands correctly. It's a great story and one that when you get to it, listeners, listen intently because the solution is simple, but the impact is huge. Huge, huge impact. Much like the hand washing situation where awareness was simply not enough, Sam shared some of his other work on implicit hiring biases. He shared several tips with us, but two that caught our attention are one, focusing on process over outcome, which can lead to higher quality new hires, and two, exploiting the diversification heuristic that by slowing down and hiring for more than one position at a time, we can simply significantly improve the diversity of new employees to the company. Yeah, well, of course, we discussed music. Of course. And we found that Sam's eclectic tastes were no surprise. He bounces between boy pop band Boyzone from Ireland, Mm -hmm. yeah, to Powderfinger. Woohoo! Great, great Aussie (laughs) band. uh, To one of his homeland's greatest bands, ACDC. Highway to hell. (laughs) And with Kurtz in my gratitude, we hope that right now you take a moment to jump onto your favorite podcatcher and leave us a positive review. It really helps us spread the word about behavioral grooves. We also want to thank you. This will be our last episode in 2018, and we are so, so grateful for you listening to us. We now have over 40 episodes. We're listened to in over 90 countries, and we have had some really, really heartfelt messages and reviews. And we owe all of that success to you and particularly to our great guests. So a very sincere, from the heart, thank you. And we look forward to many more episodes in an even greater 2019. So with that, sit back, enjoy your favorite listening beverage, and laugh along with us in our discussion with Sam Tatum. And congratulations to you for saying diversification heuristic. (laughs) Sam Tatum, welcome to the Behavioral Groups Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to speak. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good to have you. So quick speed round. Tea or coffee? Coffee. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> Quick one. Yeah, Ozzy, not, not a Brit there. Uh, if you had to live without uh, a phone or a laptop, which would you choose? Laptop. Okay. Jimmy Page or Jimi Hendrix? Hendrix. <laughs> Good call. Good call. 
Uh, social proof or loss aversion, which has more impact on people's behavior? Ooh. See, tea and coffee is easy after. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is where we start to get into the actual real content of this co- of our podcast here. Yeah, so I'm going to say social proof, social norming. Okay. Now, so, so help us understand a little bit. Why did you pick social proof over loss aversion just there? Maybe because it's so. I mean, potentially because it's a. It, it can be a positive drive. I think loss aversion can always make you sort of feel take you into a, into negative space. Um, but it's a tough question because loss aversion is such a. I mean, in its itself is a is a much um, talked about part of our psychology, but it can be quite fundamental to lots of other principles if you think about. The endowment effect. If you think about scarcity, if you think about sunk costs, loss aversion, sort of the the it's a far-reaching area of our psychology. Um, it is. But I but I but I also know that um, within my behaviour, or, or maybe more easily observed behaviour, um, sometimes social proof can be one of those those really evident drivers. Um, but a tough question. Again, not as easy as tea and coffee. That's for sure. <laughs> well, tea and coffee was really a quick. Quick pick there, just not not getting into that uh, English uh, tea and things. Or no, I'll, I'll certainly drink a cup of tea, but there's no way I'll take it over a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Did you grow up in a coffee drinking household? I, I I probably grew up in a tea drinking household. I think uh, getting myself through university, I actually used to 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 work in a bar, and and working in this bar, I remember us going through. Um, we were learning about addiction um, at uni, doing our sort of undergrad psychology, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting um, to see if I can run myself through an experiment and get addicted to coffee? I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm addicted to coffee. I don't get coffee withdrawal headaches, uh, but I certainly appreciate it as one of sort of life's little luxuries. I I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that they decided to run an experiment on that they could become addicted to anything. <laughs> but I love the fact oh that you're God. like, let's see if I can get addicted to coffee. That's success. 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 Now, when you you were at university, you were studying um, psychology. Oh, what, yes. what what inspired you, or what what drove you to do the uh, the psychology degree? That's a really good question. I think I was, um, I had two different options, luckily. I mean, it's, I, my, my, my first preference was psychology. Um, so I've always been interested in understanding, I think, people. And my second preference was actually um, graphic design. Um, so, I've, again, similarly been interested in, in, in arts and design. And, um, and, and thankfully, I got the marks to, to make it into psychology. So that's the way that I went. Uh, but I suppose that it took me about sort of seven, eight, nine years to find my way back into a bit more of a visual creative field um, that I'm that I'm lucky to be in Ogilvy. So it's sort of um, the, the two are coming together finally. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about that journey, because I think it's a really interesting journey of, of yeah. how you did go from, you know, uh, graduating with psychology degree and then you. Ultimately, you're you're now at Ogilvy, and you've been there for a while. So and you pursued a master's degree. You did the psychology wasn't just a, an afterthought. No. It was just just a, a, just an interesting thing to do as an undergraduate. You, yeah. you continued it in graduate uh, in graduate school. No, absolutely. And I think it's it's and, and for anyone again for anyone who's listening who's who's studying psychology, it's one of those. Um, fascinating disciplines that can also not be as vocational as many others. Um, so the, the lovely thing about psychology is it can have such broad um, implications and, and, and far-reaching sort of career prospects. One of the challenging things with psychology is that it has such broad um, <laughs> implications in so many different ways. So I did study, I studied um, uh, my undergrad as, as straight psychology and, and did an honours in psychology. And I was always interested in um, applying it um, to consumer um, psych in, in, in more of a marketing perspective. Um, so funnily enough, as I've, I've, I've mentioned, while I was studying, I, I put myself sort of survived through uni by working in a bar. And at the end of just finishing, just finishing my, um, my, my honours degree, I remember speaking to one of the patrons that I used to serve quite readily, talking about my interests uh, and what I wanted to do and what I was studying. And I didn't realise he was the owner of the beer brand that I kept pouring him. Um, so, <laughs> so after that, he invited me onto the, onto the team. So I spent a year... Um, running sort of um, business development and, and trying to bring some of this thinking into 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 his beer brand, 
um, that fundamentally was actually me walking around um, the, the, the center of Sydney in the outskirts of uh, Sydney in a car. Um, selling, selling the beer. So I li- I've literally paved the streets with a six pack, going to restaurants and bottle shops um, to, to to try and convince them to, to trial this beer. Um, so it's a great experience of sort of the ground up. I would be. That sounds like a really fun job to me. I mean, you do, you got to taste it with the with them, right? You know, so it's good fun, and obviously it's a really social job, right? So it's um, and I, and I think that's something again if um. Going through uni, working in hospitality is a is such a valuable experience to be able to speak to people from any any which background. And I think um, similarly when it when it became and this was fundamentally sales at the time, um, starting conversations and an appreciation of beer and um, and a and a beautiful brand and product. And I think that's I've always found um, that category just as many other sort of if you think of perfumes, if you think of soft drink. I mean, you're drinking, uh, you're smelling the marketing. <laughs> right, you're consuming um, the brand, um, so it's one of those product areas that's um, that's very hard to to pull apart um, from the the intrinsic value or the sort of the intangible value of um, the work we do as as marketeers and really the psychology and not necessarily the chemistry. Um, so I really enjoyed that, and and um, and actually my the, the managing director of the of the business um, he, he gave me tipping point. Um, so Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point um, is a Christmas present, so sort of the first entry into into a bit of Gladwell. Um, so he obviously sort of fueled some of those interests um, there. Um, but I did, um, I, I, so I only spent a, a year with the team, and I, I, while I enjoyed it, I didn't think I was using as much of the psychology as, as explicitly as I possibly could. Um, and again, in that sort of fork in the road as, as where to go, I really wanted to progress into into masters and uh, be able to um, go to a business and say, I am an X, I can do Y for you more than um, a- anyone else on the street. And I think there's a interesting space within um, certainly a, a psychology background where you can take a, a, a one sort of road down and do uh, clinical psychology. Um, and counselling and spend a lot of time um, looking at, at, at maybe sort of more abnormal or, or um, uh, less mainstream elements of, of the human brain and understanding. But I've always been more interested in in macro sort of normative behaviour. Mm-hmm. What about sort of um, our anxieties and maybe um, um, fears or, or, de- or, de- or, or, or depressions, um, but sort of why we stand in, in a particular um, way and, and how we communicate and with the power of gossip and um, the, the sort of psychology that's related to better understanding our, ourselves and our daily lives and how we interact um, t- together. And that took me down a, 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 an organisational industrial um, approach. And, and I think now if... Um, there are straight masters on behavioral economics and behavioral science that I think at the time, and it wasn't decades ago, but at the time it wasn't one of those degrees that were sort of readily available. Kurt, I think you and I, when we had dinner a couple of weeks ago, were talking about the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah. But, um, I O psychology was the way that you, you went in. Yeah. You know, it was literally 10 years ago. I think, you know, that I got my PhD. So at that no point there wasn't now. a behavioral economics or yeah. behavioral science uh, PhD. There was only IO psychology going down clinical road, which I had no, no, no interest in. I, I was not going to put somebody on a couch and, and try <laughs> yeah. to solve them. That's really interesting. And I think part of that experimentation, because I sort of at, at the fork of the road, I, I wanted to see what it was like going down um, the clinical path. So I actually spent some time. Um, there's a, a program in Australia called Lifeline. Um, so okay. it's a, 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 essentially sort of it's a, a hotline for um, people in distress and and uh, people who are essentially um, having suicidal thoughts. And so I went through the program to learn how to um, best counsel or at, at least um, maintain people on, on the phone. And I think um, that was a great um, insight, I think, into, into, that, to, into that world. And there are many skills, I think, um, from that um, exploration into a more clinical approach that I apply every day. I, I, hopefully I apply, I, I apply as often as I possibly can. And sometimes I think um, it's nice to, in our, in our business, um, to come as a, as a psychologist or, or, or draw upon the skills that we might have received even in, in industrial psychology or organizational psych um, through coaching um, to feel that you don't have to come to every room and feel like you need to have the solution. Sam, 
Um, you froze. And a lot of, you, um, and we might sort of talk a little bit about this, a lot of sort of where my passion has been driven in behavioral okay. science is really less about coming with solutions, it's more about coming with questions. Uh, and if you can actually um, train yourself to ask the right questions of others to help them get to the solution, to get the expert subject matter experts um, to the right solution, then that's better than sort of feeling the, the need to walk into a room and being the, uh, being the magician. Right. Um, that's certainly something I think that's embedded in um, a more counselling, clinical or at least coaching point of view of, of psychology that I think is totally relevant in business. Could, could, I, could I ask a favor, Sam? You just froze up for just a second, and yeah. your comment about coming in with questions rather than coming in with solutions was really good. And uh, would, would it be possible to kind of pick up from there? Would you of mind? Course, of course. Um, as I was saying, I think one of the one of the areas from from that exploration of mine into into Lifeline um, was a good realization or, or a comfort, I suppose, in not feeling like you need to have the solution. Um, and, and part of the training is to is to not come in and say sort of recommend different things to um, to, to, to clients, uh, but to come with different questions uh, to enable people to find the solution by themselves. And I think that's something I'm um, certainly in um, that I've tried to embrace um, in, in our work here at Ogilvy. Um, is and working with creative teams, it's not about sort of coming in as being the magician and dropping the solution and walking out. It's coming with uh, a series of um, a series of questions um, that, that the, the place, the theory from which the, the, the questions sort of arise is most critical for, for us. Um, yeah. but, but actually using subject matter experts to come up with the solutions, but, but provoking them in a slightly different way. They say, don't, don't come in and ask someone to say, ouch, just prick them with a pin. So I hope you come up, <laughs> hopefully come up with more and more questions that can elicit, elicit the response. So uh, I, I just want to make sure you're not saying that you you go into your customers, and kidding, right? That's not really what you're intending here. But um, it, it's really interesting. You, you talk about that because in the the when we were at the behavioral science and marketing conference and you were speaking, one of the the comments that I wrote down from you was uh, that we need more powerful questions and that we need yeah. to ask different questions to get past that system two yes. component in how we think. And so that's what I hear. Maybe some of that that training around the clinical component with Lifeline actually helps you to realize that it's the, those questions and how you get those questions. Would you agree yeah, with that? I think certainly maybe maybe that experience was more that I don't need to have the answer. Okay. Um, so 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 I so 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 learning to have questions to um to take people through and being comfort sort of more comfortable in silence, I think was probably one of the the, the biggest learnings. But the point maybe where, where the two married together um, was uh, actually having lunch with my, my, my girlfriend's family at the time. Uh, and, and her cousin was talking about the time that she was pregnant with her second baby. Uh, and and it, they knew the sex, she knew the sex of the baby, her husband knew the sex of the baby, and her youngest daughter uh, knew the sex, the gender of the baby, and no one else in the family knew. And she was retelling the story about sort of for months and months, as you can imagine, everyone was interrogating this poor young girl <laughs> to, to give up. Uh, is it a boy or a girl? Um, what's the gender of the baby going to be? Is it a boy or a girl? What's the sex? And she amazingly, she kept tight, tight-lipped uh, until someone asked a slightly different question. Um, so rather than asking, is, is it a boy or a girl? Um, someone asked, what's the name of the baby going to be? And she said, Sophia. Uh, and I think at the time, that's when the penny really dropped for me. Um, because actually the a mentality of coming in, it, it's similarly in sort of some of my, my work as an organizational psych uh, in, in business, it's really about creating an, an environment for which uh, the business can succeed. Um, so I was lucky to work in, a, in an investment bank in Australia and my role there was in organizational development and, and working with a team of psychologists. Uh, but it was very clear, I mean, we weren't the revenue generating team. Right. Our, our, our role was to build an environment to, um, to, to get people with the right skill sets and, and, and the right culture um, to be successful. And I think the same thing is true of a strategist within an advertising or creative agency. Um, our role, it's not that, that, that other people can't have ideas, and that's exactly sort of what's, what's, what's um, s- supported here. But I think for a lot of my career, my, my role has been building an environment, providing people with provocations by which uh, the idea is that the magic really happens. And, and this moment, um, sort of hearing the story about um, Sophia, 
was for me a lovely example of how sort of a slightly different question can elicit a very different answer. Um, yeah. That's where I think for me the analogy lands back in, in our world in, in behavioral science, that what behavioral science can give us are a range of different ways of interrogating a problem. Um, and there are, we, we know there are sort of many, many heuristics and many different sort of pr principles or levers that we might draw upon. Um, but it's, it's, it's useless to, um, to go into a workshop and, and try and um, ed educate a, a, a new team or a creative partnership every time about the sort of the ins and outs of prospect theory. It doesn't, yeah. really, it doesn't really work. Um, but if you, can, if you can sort of get someone, if you can tap into the concept of loss aversion and ask someone how, how might we make it feel like someone might miss out on it if they, if they don't do it. Um, or social norming, how might we make it feel like their friend has done it just before them. Or how might we make it feel like it's popular? Or what, what might we leave behind in the environment um, right. that can show that someone else was there before? That's a question that everyone can answer. Um, so, so that's sort of a, the approach that we've been on. But do you, uh, do you feel a need when you're talking to clients to sort of justify or, or provide some uh, foundational basis for this is the behavior? We're going to be using a behavioral lens because right. it works and here's some evidence. Yeah. Uh, you know, do you do you need to do that, or or you skip over that, and and as you say, just go to questions like, well, you know, what can we what can we do to help them understand loss aversion from a personal yeah. perspective? I, I, and I think that two different audiences. I think one is helping us to generate the solution, and the other is reinforcing why we we think it's right. Oh, um, yeah. So, and sometimes we can um, have too much information and complexity that that. Um, those two things that otherwise wouldn't have met <laughs> but come together to form a, a unique creative idea, that doesn't occur because there's just too much information. We, we bog it down. But I think it's important, and sometimes um, the solutions that we find might sound so obvious in retrospect, um, but it's important that we at least are able to say, well, this is, this is why we think this is so powerful. Um, is there a difference between the, uh, the locksmith that comes to your house for, uh, for $60 and in 10 seconds uh, uh, t takes care of your lock versus the locksmith for the same $60 takes almost an hour. Exactly. Um, exactly. They're, they're There's a, a lovely sort of labor illusion or at least an appreciation of what's happening there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's very important for us that we don't lose sight of, of where it came from. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, within our team, I mean, every every time we sort of start from the foundation of psychology and behavioral science, it's really important that we interrogate the problem um, through this lens. Uh, we generate different ways in that come from an appreciation of, of, of biases or heuristics or how we navigate the planet. Um, but, but not everyone who we work with or in different rooms benefit from that kind of information. Um, and certainly if the outcome is a, is a, is a fresh idea. Um, but we need to be able to sort of bring the right ingredients to, to, to bear uh, and then, again, build an environment in which something a bit more magical and um, serendipitous can occur. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean heavy theory, um, but it can mean going back to the pin uh, or going back to the, the different question of what was her name versus um, is it a boy or a girl? We'll ask a different question, we'll get a different answer. Right. Um, or if we focus on asking sort of, um, provocative questions that that stem from our understanding of psychology, um, then then that's a great place. And okay. I, and yeah. on that, sorry, sorry, Tim, but I think on that because I think it often amazes 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 me, and and we'll be in workshops, and literally two days beforehand, we will have written the questions ourselves, and I can be in a workshop in a novel environment and ask myself the same question I wrote three days ago and come up with a different solution. Yeah, and for me, that's when you you know it's working. Actually, when you can trick yourself into an idea, that's a lovely thing. Yeah, I love that. Well, so uh, can you give us an example? The, the, this is really great theoretical stuff. Mm -hmm. Could you walk us through uh, a client, uh, anonymous as 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 they may be, or if you've got a client that you could you could actually speak to or a brand? No, to of course. Uh, there are there are a few we can talk to, and so one piece that I think has sort of lovely lateral connections, a piece of work. Uh, we did a number of years ago um, uh, for Kimberly Clark Professional. Um, so essentially, um, the, the the challenge was to in, it, help people clean their hands in in a food processing plant. Um, and you imagine we thought it was a um, the, the the broader team thought it was a we're going to a chocolate factory in Santiago, and uh, but it was actually a pig abattoir. Um, the, the team <laughs> 
um, and, and it's um, and 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 basically, how can we in, in get people or encourage people to, um, to to wash their hands? We know that foodborne disease is a, a huge challenge, not only for the workers, uh, but you imagine for for product recall, for for brand health. Um, there's a sort of massive implications. Um, and we can start to ask different questions of, of, about that. And I think what's really interesting and, and part of the, um, the, the insight that led to the, the final solution was looking at a, 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 I think it's a tool called GlowGerm. Basically, it closes the, the, the salient feedback loop. It's very hard for us to see um, bacteria on our hands, right? right. We, don't have that, we don't have that salient feedback loop. Uh, <laughs> Dulux. Uh, it's a style of paint uh, in Australia that found the same insight, right? It's very hard to paint white ceilings uh, with white paint. You don't have that salient feedback loop. Right? So they right. a style of paint that goes on pink and dries white. Um, so it's a really lovely, organic, natural piece of behavioral science that we can extract value from. Um, some, some chemists um, have come up with a nail polish that turned black when it's in touch with um, rohypnol and date rape drugs. So you stir your drink with your finger, and if your finger turns black, you know that your drink has been spiked. Really lovely, creative piece of behavioral science that addresses this salient feedback loop. So the question, I, I suppose, uh, maybe a slightly different question that you, you could ask someone of um, cleaning their hands, and there are lots of different ways you could encourage that. Um, we could think of sort of authority figures. We could sort of try to normalize the behavior more explicitly. Uh, and the solution that we that we came up with was really closing this salient feedback loop. Uh, and the solution was a, 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 a small hand stamp. So it was a hand stamp made of a sticky organic ink <laughs> um, that uh, shaped like a dirty E. coli that you put on your hand before you go through the hand washing process. And if you still had this hand stamp on your hand, on the, at, the, at the end of it, you knew your hand wasn't clean. Right. And it provided you with much needed salient feedback that otherwise you, you wouldn't have had. And I think it's a lovely, I mean, it's a it's a two dollar solution for a multi million dollar problem, um, mm. that comes from just thinking less about sort of how might we encourage or educate people about sort of bacteria and the dangers, but by actually providing someone with with a sense of salient feedback that wasn't there otherwise. Yeah, I think we need that stamp for all of our kids when they're going <laughs> in the bathroom because I swear that the the ten seconds that they wash their hands is not yeah. really enough after yes. going to the bathroom. Your kids take ten. <laughs> That's so interesting, interestingly, what we found, so we had, we actually ended up doing sort of a, a swab of people's hands. So we counted uh, sort of the platelet count yeah. um, and had a sort of a 63% reduction of, of dangerously um, dirty, dirty, dirty hands. But we had a, a far greater um, decrease for the night shift workers. Um, okay. So part of part of the suspicion on, on the success for night shift is actually it became sort of more of a social policing device. So it might have been. So, so while we think it might have been working sort of at an individual level, so you can see that your hands are clean or not. Also, if, if you're walking around with a with a with a stamp on your hand in the factory, right, then you become sort of far easier to self police that um, by others. So that social proof that we talked about at the very beginning coming exactly. in and, and having more of a subtle a subtle way in, and that's I think sometimes we can ask um, different provocations that might stem from a, a single principle but uh, in our experience um interventions that have multiple sort of facets um, right. can, be, can be strongest so sam we probably should have asked this question earlier but can you tell the listeners what your role is at ogilvy yeah. and, and what are you doing because i think uh, yeah. we went right into the, the no, solution. No, no, of course but tell us about what you do so, of course, so I, I run a, the behavioral science practice within Ogilvy Consulting out of, out of London. Um, so it was a, a business we were formerly known as Ogilvy Changed, and we've, um, over the last little while we've merged um, within our consulting group, which is just an amazing opportunity to continue to have discussions, I think, um, what might be considered at a, at a, um, a higher upstream than, than, than the broader agency previously. Um, Rory Sutherland. Uh, who who I, I know you both know um, well and, and many of the listeners may, may have heard of. So Rory founded our, our practice uh, almost seven years ago, really with the belief um, that, that advertising agencies or creative agencies like Ogilvy have all the, the ability, the, the, the smarts and creativity to, to behave like a general hospital, uh, but we're typically used as cosmetic surgeons. So we're sort of the last... <laughs> 
we're the last line of defense before something goes into market versus actually having the ability to, to fundamentally change a business um, or um, how, a, how an organization operates. Uh, and I think over the last six years, we've been able to sort of expose our creative thinkers and our team more broadly to briefs that we otherwise wouldn't have had access to or felt um, that we have a solution for uh, if we if we were um, just seen as, as an advertising agency. So this has taken us into, again, into, into food processing plants, looking at hygiene, done a lot of work over the last 18 months in safety, behavioral safety, okay. so, uh, again, helping people understand um, how they navigate um, the, the planet and certainly in areas of, of high familiarity and coming up with interventions to help people come home safely every day. And that's right. not the sort of brief that we typically get um, as, as Ogilvy advertising. Uh, we do a lot of work in unconscious bias, uh, in recruitment and promotion decisions. So helping, again, people to better understand the, the biases at play. And this, these can be the same biases that inform how we order a pizza as we, as we recruit um, for, for a summer school. Um, and then also some of the nuance in, 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 in more stereotype biases that we need to be aware of. And again, building processes and procedures to, to help us uh, against that. Um, we, we obviously do work uh, embedded with within the broader advertising team to ensure that uh, big creative platforms um, stem from um, uh, deep-rooted insight uh, and an understanding of, of, of behavioral science or, or evolutionary psychology. Um, yeah. So it's a lovely sort of eclectic mix from, from safety through to campaigns through to physical interventions, and that could be working with Gap, Gatwick Security, um, helping people to, to, to not carry liquids on their luggage, all the way through to a lot of work we're doing in the UK at the moment in, in food waste. Um, so arming people with different ways of navigating supermarkets to buy the right amount of food for them so they don't buy, sort of overbuy almost. Um, and when they take the, the food home, how can we in, ensure that it's, that it's eaten or, or stored appropriately? Um, so we're, we're very lucky in the, the diversity of different um, briefs that we can work on from sort of physical, real world to, to digital to, to categories that we really are sort of, it's, it's not our skill set necessarily. We don't, we don't consider ourselves as being experts in safety, but we, we make sure we work with our safety partners to provide them with different ways of looking at their problem. Uh, and if when we come together, I think that's where we can come up with really novel sort of um, hopefully game changing solutions that we wouldn't have, have had otherwise. Yeah, so you're bringing a different lens into some of those areas because of the background that we have or you have uh, in in psychology, evolutionary psychology, the way that humans operate and think and, and the heuristics and biases that we all have. That, that safety expert can be an expert in safety, but they may not have that background. And so bringing those two, I think you brought about it earlier, where you bring two divergent ideas together yeah. and there can be something magic that happens at that, that transition point. Yeah, yeah, we often say uh, we have a responsibility to, to our clients um, to deliver best practice. Um, so um, really important if we're working on a, on, a, on a category or if we're looking at the health, healthy eating behaviors, if we're looking at smoking cessation, if we're looking at um, parts, of, parts of our collective world that there's a lot of research behind what, what works, it's really important that we don't say, yes, that's really effective, but how about this magical thing over there? So we, we have a responsibility to deliver um, best practice. Um, yeah. I think we also see a, a, a responsibility to our discipline uh, to bring discovered practice, to, ah. so to, find, to find new and novel ways in which we can a, a, apply psychology to stretch us. And I think um, that's where creativity really, really has a role. Uh, and that's, again, I mean, fundamentally, what, why Ogilvy? Um, it, it, there's no point in being creative and ineffective, uh, but we believe that the more, <laughs> that the more creative um, we can become with the effective ingredients, we can do something quite special. Uh, can you go back to the unconscious bias in, um, in hiring? This is, uh, I, I think that this is something that, that plagues many, many uh, corporate uh, human resource directors. Yes. How, how they can still be effective in hiring, make sure that they're getting the right people in the yeah. door, and at the same time, uh, well, in some ways, maybe protect them, protect the organization from potential lawsuit, but also actually just do a better job of hiring the best person. Yeah. Uh, given to our biases, uh, what, what? Tell us a, a little bit about that that work. Yeah, I think, and again, it's a, a, another important discussion. We've done a lot of work within Ogilvy um, globally around around diversity um, and and unconscious bias. 
Um, so Ogilvy in this instance is, is is certainly driving. We're sort of practicing what we what we preach from New York all the way uh, through through London and EMEA and, and down to South America. And I think the most important thing uh, in this space is that awareness alone um, doesn't necessarily do the trick. <laughs> just just making people aware and comfortable with the fact that they're biased um, doesn't necessarily mean now we'll be recruiting um, um, the, the right workforce. And 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 again, going back to um, our expertise. I would never stand in a room and say we're experts in diversity quotas and things like that. What what we hope to remove are the biases that might might prevent the person who's best equipped from delivering on the role, the, the job. Um, and this can be um, uh, 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 and sort of exposing opportunities for us to to, to hire more diverse um, quotas of people. So um, we know, for example, um, from the diversification heuristic <laughs> that can impact how we sort of buy buy our stocks or our shares, or how we a lovely study conducted on um, the selection of, of of different snacks for university students over the course of two different time periods. And yeah. um, one time period they asked, what 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 snacks would you like for the next six weeks? And please select them now. Yeah. Um, and we find actually people tend to select a diverse group of snacks. If you ask them every night for the next six weeks, they'll probably have six Mars bars. <laughs> so that's that's something that we know from commercial application of decision making and sort of deep rooted Thaler behavioral economics that can be applied in hiring decisions just by thinking let's not hire sequentially individual by individual let's build a mentality of of hiring in groups um so summer schools or within Ogilvy in in, in the states the, the super saturday program of if you hire in multiples of people, then you tend to naturally hire more more diverse collections of individuals. So that's a lovely um, part of our psychology that we'll, we could take to another client and speak in a totally different category that's just related to how we make decisions. Uh, but similarly, when we look at, uh, at bias within recruitment, it can be looking at um, the job advertisements and what, and what language might we be using that feels gendered um, mm-hmm. Or might feel like it's 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 um, ex- 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 excluding men or excluding women. We know from lots of studies done on on CVs um, that different um, uh, either minority or minority names on CVs can equate to almost eight years of experience um, for this for this for the same um, sort of person with different names. So um, different technology that we can start to remove um, information that's not relevant to the to the role in itself like it like a name or a, or a gender just the experience um all the way through to how we sort of what what sort of what sort of environment should we be conducting these meetings within um what sort of emotional state should the interviewer be in right um, make sure that they're consistent right we all know the story of the hungry judges let's make sure we <laughs> we treat ourselves the same um, so let's try and keep consistency on time of the day. Let's try to make sure we do it on a full stomach. So it's basically trying to find what are the things that we know influence our decision making universally, but also specifically when it comes to um, um, uh, minorities or um, or instances where we, where we might sort of feel biased. Is and I think having an appreciation that um, at some point in our lives, whether it's age, whether it's by becoming a, a parent. Um, whether it's being of a different ethnic background, at some point in our lives, we will uh, fall into a, a, a category. Um, so how can we, again, as an organization, make sure we um, not only have a foundational understanding that this is really important and, and shapes our decisions, uh, but that we have processes and protocols in place um, from how we word our, our, our job advertisements to um, the environment in which we interview, um, the process in which we select CVs, all the way through to um, the, the, the nature in which we conduct internal meetings to be uh, as uh, rewarding and open for someone who might be um, extroverted as they are an in, in, introvert. Uh, and I think um, these are discussions that we don't have enough. Right. A- a- absolutely. It reminds me of a conversation we had with uh, Linnea Gandhi, yes. uh, who is a professor at the Booth School, uh, University of Chicago. And we were, you know, she's deep into behavioral sciences and struggles with how do I grade papers in such a way yeah. that uh, I get enough papers at the same time so yeah. I've got a group that I can compare to, but that I'm using the same, you know, heuristic, the same decision points and looking for exactly the same elements in yeah. each of those papers in a way that is consistent. It's hard. Yeah. It's really, really hard. Well, and even she brings up a really interesting point of saying if I read a really great paper, 
then do I automatically, is that biasing the next paper that I read? Yeah. Because it's now my reference point is this really great paper, yeah. which if I would have read the other paper in, in first. first, I would have given it a higher grade than others. And I think same thing can be said in the hiring process, right? I mean, you yeah. get fantastic candidate and then you get a really good candidate. Well, that really good candidate doesn't necessarily yeah. line up. The look is good. So and I think one of the biggest and maybe less explicit um, elements um, of this is, is, is buying ourselves more time. Yeah. Um, actually, these things fundamentally they take they take time. Um, so some of the interventions can simply be um, how do we protect time to make sure we do it properly because we all know and um, we get into the throes of of a busy week um, and uh, and to do things as we would like or what we know uh, becomes very difficult. Right. It's just downright countercultural. I mean, to take more time that just seems crazy. Yeah. <laughs> completely, completely. <laughs> You're supposed to do things faster and yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're, cheaper, we're, we're, you know. more efficient. Yeah, is is, is sometimes the, the 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 danger of um, more efficient in the long term, or more productive, or more creative. Exactly, yeah, I think yeah. that's true. Yeah. What um, I, I want to go back at when you were actually talking about your beer um, uh, days when you were selling <laughs> beer, right? Of you, course, you, of course, Kurt. I go back, back to, to the beer, beer. right? Um, yeah. But you said something that I thought was really interesting, and I just I thought it would be interesting to kind of dig in a little bit deeper about it. And you talked about it about consuming the brand that uh, you know, like you know, perfume the, the the actual component is that smelling the, brand. the smelling the brand that you're actually consuming the brand, and, and the brand itself actually impacts how we consume and how we think we consume the brand. And so I, you know, do. You, is some of this work that you guys are doing up front now with with the organizations are you taking that look into it and again i go back to you know some of the the studies where they 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 did wine studies on wine and they basically said they took exactly the same wine and said one was really expensive and one yeah. wasn't yeah and, you know the difference people that they re reported but they actually put them in fmri studies and they actually taste i mean the, so the people actually tasted the wine differently um, because they they thought it was an expensive wine, yeah, and so yeah. you said consume the brand. That's where I went immediately. Went so no, I think it's. I mean, that's that's one of the most for me one of the most interesting parts of of of, of what we do is that um, belief in in um, in a in a brand. Um, we work in in the areas of sort of intangible value. Right. Yeah. There's some, some time of whether this is controversial, and it probably is, but that's okay. Um, but I think Nurofen, <laughs> Nurofen were fined. Um, I think it was Nurofen um, for coming up with sort of Nurofen neck and Nurofen back. Um, but it was actually the same sort of active ingredient. They just gave it a different sub brand. Um, <laughs> and, and, and and you could look at that and say, well, are they lying to consumers? Um, and it's well. Not if you've got a neck pain and you use this, I'm sure it's good for your for for, for your neck. Yeah. Um, but but also I think it might even work even better than if a generalist um, yeah. paracetamol because you have the belief that it's working on your neck. So exactly the same as you were saying just now, Kurt. If if the wine is expensive, we we might enjoy it more. If yeah. someone if someone says, I mean, we use the same sort of analogy when I did some work when I was back in Australia for for BMW and talking about sort of the test drive experience. And we likened it to a sommelier. Um, and a sommelier might tell you, look, taste the, you, I mean, I'm sure you can taste the asparagus in that Sav Blanc. <laughs> and, and, you know, and as soon as someone says that, you, you can't miss the asparagus. <laughs> um, so if you're, if you're trying to increase someone's enjoyment, right, that's, what's the hedonic appeal of an experience? And you're taking someone for a test drive in a, in a, in a new Beamer. And you talk about the technology that's driving that steering control and you, and you just appreciate it far more. So it's it's shining a new light on on a value that exists, um, or or it's creating intangible value that's um, that's that harm harm free, um, right. and 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 sometimes it can feel very counterintuitive. Um, you want something to to sell more, um, increasing the price wouldn't necessarily be the logical rational approach, but sometimes actually just making something more expensive reinforces the value that we know. Yeah. Sometimes talking about the downside. Um, can be the thing that that actually drives the, the perception of value. If Listerine um, didn't burn the inside of your mouth, you probably wouldn't um, believe that it was doing anything proactive. 
So Rory often uses um, the, the example of, of Coca-Cola. If we were to think of how we might Im improve the sales of, of Coca-Cola um, in a room or through sort of a traditional neoclassical lens of economics, we might say, um, make it cheaper, make it bigger, make it taste better. Um, but actually, if you look at some of the competitors over the last uh, 10 years or so, it's, if you think of a brand like Red Bull, um, that's half the size, twice the price, and costs a little bit terrible, uh, tastes a little bit terrible, um, actually just the taste that it tastes a little bit like shit reinforces the value that it must be doing something good. Um, <laughs> and and that, that, is in, that is in the realms of, of, of how we process information, our psychology. Tim, a while ago you mentioned the example of a, of a locksmith opening a door, right? Um, if a locksmith comes and you pay them $60 and they toil away at the door and you think that's, that's great, you've earned your money. If the right locksmith comes with the right key and opens the door immediately, that, that, that money is sort of harder to spend. Um, kayak, I think, well, I think Michael Norton um, did, some, did some research looking into the labor illusion of search uh, sort of travel sites. And actually, I'm um, finding that people have people appreciate it more if the site takes a little bit longer because they feel <laughs> like it's doing the work for them. Um, and Google could give us the answer in 0 0.005 of a second, but slowing it down actually reinforces the value that was there, right? So sometimes, if we look at when we we started this conversation about consuming the brand or consuming the belief, and I think that's really interesting as sort of more traditional in in advertising and marketing that perfume is just. Basically, you're smelling the model. Um, so that's why it's so important to, to get right. the model right because that's so critical to, um, to your aspiration and, and perception. Um, that same um, line of thought um, carries into multiple different facets of, of service and experience. And I, I like to think um, they're all improving um, our experience on, on, on earth. Um, yeah. if, you, if you can increase perception of wine, then increase perception of wine. Yeah. Uh, if you can make – go, sorry, go, Kurt. Oh, no, I was just going to say it you, when you talked about the neurofin neck and, and versus back, it's that placebo effect to a certain degree, right? I mean, when you do studies with pharmaceutical companies, they always have to have the, the, the placebo in there because yeah. they know just by giving somebody a pill, it's going to improve their, their outcomes. And so you can't just uh, say that this pill actually has an effect until, yes. you know, an effect until you, yeah. um, you know, have that placebo and see it doing better than placebo. And yeah. You're just applying a placebo effect in, in yeah. many situations. So, and I, and I think it's um, in lots of different work that we do, you can, you can think that you see with your eyes and you taste with your tongue and you mm -hmm. listen with your ears, um, but you don't, right? So you, you, you taste with your nose, you, ex you experience it in as much through olfactory as you do gustatory. Um, yeah. You, you have composite perception when you look visually. Um, so actually, it, it, while these might be the, the inputs of stimulus, they're, they're not where it's received and felt by the individual. Um, so if you start to think about composites of perception that can be informed by memory, it can be informed by context, that can be formed by belief, um, then this is a really interesting space for us to play um, when you start to look at, again, um, certainly from a marketing perspective in, in brand, but also when we look at um, work that we do again on um, changing the context within um, a, a supermarket to ensure that people buy the right amount of food for them um, to prevent food waste. Um, the, the relevance um, of some of this thinking is, is far broader um, than we might have originally thought. Sam, you've talked, you've mentioned the word context and environment several times in our conversation. Yeah. And uh, Kurt and I are big believers in the importance of and the influence that environment and context have on, on our decision-making. We are? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, we are, sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I am. Kurt's <laughs> just dragging along for this. But I was, what I was wondering, um, you, you, you've talked about changing environment in, uh, in uh, factories, you know, for, uh, for cleanliness. You talked about the, changing the environment or modifying environmental things for in, um, in consumer experiences, uh, both in the experience of a, of a brand or a product or in how they purchase them. Um, you know, on, on the scale of things that you want to influence or modify, where, do, where does environment fit? Do you, do you think it's at the top? I don't, I don't, I don't want to be leading the witness here, but, no, but no, no. Yeah. environment might be the most important thing. I think so, or the point of interaction, right? So, so the environment could be a website. It, it doesn't necessarily. So it really depends on where the decision is being is being made. 
Um, but I think certainly, and and, and um, we can have all the, the will and the theory in the world, uh, but we know that context is is really king. Um, so when we go into into uh, to conduct interventions for different clients, um, we might have hypotheses of what we think might work, and they could be dependent on the context. That could be a, sh- a, a shift in the environment, or at least we know that the context will, will moderate that effect. Um, so I think it's a to Dilip Soma will sort of talk about starting from the last mile, uh, ah. and that's really the place that we similarly start. Um, so if we, and and you can have all the the appetite and ambition and um, the the belief and 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 um, and desire, um, but if there's a bottleneck when we get to a bottleneck when we get to sort of the, the last mile or um, the the environment is just not conducive of the action, um, then the action won't occur. Yeah. So uh, we'd like to, uh, I'd like to switch over to music. You always like to move. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that, uh, that I found, and we both found fascinating about uh, meeting you in San Francisco uh, a, a few weeks ago or months ago, well, how of time is whatever time, I don't know. But, um, but you, you likened, you used a musical metaphor of songwriting to, uh, to uh, explode the idea of applying behavioral sciences. Yeah. And and we found that absolutely fascinating. Could you would you mind taking just just two short minutes and just yeah. just do a recap for our listeners because this whole idea of, of well it, it was it's just a great idea. So we get we, inspired, jamming, all yeah, those yeah. kind of fun. So. No, no, thank you, thank you very much. I, I mean, it's certainly been a helpful analogy um, that, that we've used internally, and I think fundamental to it is is an assumption. I think that behavioral science isn't isn't new. Um, so we've long been tapping into human psychology in, 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 in marketing, as policymakers, as as as, uh, as entrepreneurs. We we might just not have we just haven't really known what we were we were doing. So for, for eons, restaurateurs have have filled their restaurants from the front window back to normalise patronage, right, to make it feel popular. Um, a closing down sale is a scarcity heuristic. Um, crafty shopkeepers used to put the sort of the price on the bottom of items so you needed to pick up the item to see the price really lovely subtle commitment device so these are things that have existed but what's I think really novel and what's I think exploded over the last sort of decade um, is the work of government and academia to codify um, the the world of of, of our psychology Uh, and that's where I think um, frameworks like um, the, 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 the Behavioural Insights team and the Institute of Cabinet and Government working with the, the UK government. So frameworks like EAST, make it easy, make it attractive, make it social, make it timely. Um, frameworks like Mindspace, um, where we have sort of messenger effects all the way through to default commitment device and, and, and talking to ego. And by, codif- uh, by codifying uh, our psychology into these sort of sim- simple um, models, makes it really accessible. And, and the analogy that, um, that, that we like to use is sort of it demystifies um, from the world of magic, right? You might uh, think of it being sort of the dark arts and conjuring up sort of uh, illusions. Uh, and, and we do love illusions just to sort of show how the brain works. Um, but actually we, we move a, a little bit away from sort of magic and the dark arts to something uh, more closely resembling the, the notes and, and chords of, of music. Um, and, and you might think that, um, and we'll go into a workshop and we'll talk about East or we'll talk about Mind, mind Space and, and, and those are just two that I think are really applicable and, and easy. And you might say, well, they might be creatively l- sort of limiting. Right. Right? Assumption, let's look at Mind Space. There's just nine different principles in Mind Space. Surely that's creatively limiting. And I think the analogy there is even a guitar only has six strings, right? So it doesn't, it's, it, it, it doesn't necessarily, so, so we're doing well with, with Mindspace. We've got three more chords to play. Um, <laughs> yeah. there's, there, there, there's, a, there's an A minor and an A sharp and an A flat, um, just as there are lots of different ways you can unpack um, the messenger effect. Right. You can think of authority. You can think of likeness. You can think about sort of convert communicators. There's, once you understand that this concept of a messenger or an M exists, there are lots of different shades in, in that color, just as there are different um, shades of, a, of an A, being an A minor and an A flat. Um, so having sort of um, this consistent um, way of navigating behavioral science um, and this really simple way, I mean, it's just the tip of the iceberg 
um, just as, as, as you're starting learning to play a song. And this is sort of where the analogy continues, right? As you're learning to play music, and we, it, it, in San Francisco, we use the, the analogy of Jimi Hendrix um, to, to, to bring us through. Uh, and specifically, Jimmy um, playing the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock in 1969, and it's um, and the Star Spangled Banner is a well-known song, <laughs> and it's actually uh, sort of um, the, the tune is is off of a British song to an acre in, in heaven. So in itself, is not the most unique of of musical pieces. <laughs> <laughs> What Jimmy did was splice it with amplifier feedback and the, to sort of mimic the sounds of, of jets flying overhead and bombs dropping from the Vietnam War. So he took um, the standard notes and chords and progressions of, of the Star Spangled Banner and he made it very much his own and he made it quite unique and quite special. One of the sort of defining moments of Woodstock, one of the sort of most pivotal moments, moments in, in, in rock history. Um, and if you if we think about Jimmy, right, he's, he didn't just – Start as a 13-year-old playing the, the guitar with his teeth. Um, he, he started learning the standard notes and chords that were passed down. So I think as we, as we talk about getting into behavioral science, this is a great place to start. Start with frameworks um, from, from uh, teams like the Behavioral Insight team, like, like East and, and Mindspace, really lovely, palatable ways of understanding the, 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 the discipline. Um, and then being comfortable, actually, that there is – elements and there's value that we can extract from behavioral science that isn't necessarily in a textbook or a peer-reviewed journal. Right? Uh, we might um, know about the, the virtues and the power of social norming from Cialdini and hotel room experiments, right? That sort of really lovely fundamental points in the history of, of the evolution of behavioral science. Um, but if we know that that's what we're looking to, um, to find within our environment, we know, let's say on Mindspace, that's an N, a norm. Yeah. Um, then what other norms might be out there? Right? So a pile of cigarettes is a norm. Mm. Right? So, so if, we can, if we can sort of get creative inspiration from a pile of cigarettes, just as we would from, from Robert Cialdini's um, hotel room experiments, then that just gives us a far greater reach of inspiration to, to generate um, powerful ideas. I love that. Like and that's where we sort of close the loop on questions um, because um, these sort of uh, nudges in the wild or these natural examples of psychology in, in, in nature can just give us a slightly different question. Um, so rather than uh, let's look at the, the famous hotel room experiment where um, Cialdini sort of referenced that um, in, in three different conditions, and I know for many of our listeners will be familiar to this, but uh, in three different conditions, the first condition encouraged people to reuse their towels to save the environment. 35% right. of people reused their towels. When they changed the message to most people who stay in this hotel reuse their towels, um, that figure jumped up to 44%. And when they, when they actually said sort of a very specific social norm, most people who stay in this room um, reuse their towels, that figure jumped up to 49%. Um, so really lovely uh, experimental design on the power of social norms. But the question that might stem from that, that we would ask another problem, is how might we reference um, the desired norm, right? Um, that would be the, maybe the creative provocation. But that's very different to the provocation of what might, what might we leave um, to show that someone was there before, right? That's that's what we learned from a cigarette or a pack of cigarettes, right? Um, I, I love you know those sort of rip tag flyers when someone's got sort of Spanish lessons and you rip off the mobile phone number. Yeah, um, I, I love that again as another really lovely piece of organic behavioral science. It's a norming device with an inbuilt scarcity heuristic. <laughs> the, the, more, the more mobile phone numbers are taken away, the sort of the fewer the chances of, of, of getting one. But again, very different social norm, right? What, what can we actually take away to show that someone's been there before? How might we make it look worn or well-trodden? Uh, or, or what might we remove from the context that should otherwise have been there um, that can show that this is something that people have conducted before? And we won't always um, come up with a solution there, right? Um, and I think that's really important when it comes to sort of our, our approach. But if you don't ask a question, you'll never know. Um, so often when we run workshops here in Ogilvy, we'll have a picture of Ronan Keating uh, on, the, on the back wall. Because it's, so, it's, it's okay if you say nothing at all. Um, so maybe that's, a, Tim, that's another bit of, of, of music coming in. It's okay if you say nothing at all. But if you don't ask a question, then you'll never have the answer. 
I love that. Okay, so um, what 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 do you like to listen to? What do I like to listen to? But I think that what's really interesting about Spotify at the moment is I almost don't know the bands or artists. I know songs. I know I grew up. I grew up in Australia, so listening to lots of Powderfinger and lots of ACDC and and things like that. Powderfinger, um, so love it. Yes, <laughs> that's probably sort of the, the music I grew up on. Um, big fan of maybe it's a bit sort of melancholic, but certainly um, music that 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 drives emotion. So I've been a big fan of David Gray for many years. Oh, um, yeah. so he's, um, he's a he's a great artist. Um, and now I think um, it's amazing. Over after a while, you sort of you'll listen to Spotify, and sometimes the, sort of the recommendation will take me down a very sort of folk route. Um, and sometimes I sort of need to sort of bring back up and and, and start again. But um, that's a bit of that's a bit of my taste, I suppose. So, so if it's too folky, you get bogged down, and uh, and you say, no, 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 you got to get get more electric. If, if it's complete, if it's complete folk and country, then it might be a bit far. But it's not to say I I don't have a couple of Willie Nelsons that play on occasion that I don't skip. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, uh, well, uh, with, with that, I, I think we want to just express our gratitude to you, Sam, for this wonderful conversation. Sam, this has been fun. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to reconnect and see you and, and look forward to continuing the discussion. All right. right, Will do. Will do. Take we'll care. talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learn from our behavior groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our good on your accent brains. That was possibly one of the worst Australian accents I've ever heard. Good on you, mate. It's oh, that was better. That was that was better. Um, it's but it, it wouldn't it would be the it, it will remain the worst until I try an Australian accent, which I've done before, and I'm not going to. So we'll, we'll, uh, yes, but that's we should probably we should good. probably just stay away from accents in general. Maybe that's maybe that's. Good. I don't think that's yes. our that is not our forte. We are not the no uh, people that can do good on you, mate. Accents. No, it's, oh God, let's stay away from it. It's it's so it's so hard. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Tim, impressions from Sam. What what do you want to groove on? I, w- I want to first talk about um, the feedback. I, I, it starts with the uh, food processor case study. Right. The, the the salient feedback loop. The salient feedback loop and how um, how the intervention is so simple. Yes. How uh, first of all, of course, uh, humans go to well if we just put up posters. And we let people know when we remind them a lot, then of course they'll follow the rules. Of course. All you need is more information. <laughs> you just need big brother looking down on you. You need what? Yeah. This that, is this is the G.I. Joe fallacy. Yes. Information isn't even half enough. Right. It, it, it doesn't even come close to actually helping the problem. Uh, the What helped the problem was a very simple salient feedback loop. Uh, with with the stamp, and I thought that that was a marvelous, marvelous intervention that you know may not be able to be replicated everywhere. I mean, uh, of course, if you're in a food processing plant, it's probably a good idea, right? But you 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 know, uh, you, corporations don't have this problem, uh, <laughs> you know, with with getting up and moving from cube to cube, you know, for a lot of people. But it's it's a marvelous way of thinking about and framing a, a problem to say okay, maybe we should just go to the root of the problem, and that is we don't see germs. Right. We don't see germs. We don't understand how good or bad our hand washing is. Right. We make the assumption, hey, I can wash my hands, and I'm, hey, I, I washed, I used a little bit of soap, I'm done. So right. like like Dulux Paint created a salient feedback loop by spreading spreading on pink and turning white. Right. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And and I have used that paint, and it really is yeah, really. brilliant. It really does. <laughs> you're seriously. You have a roller. You have it on, a, on an extension, you know, and you're you're rolling the your ceiling. You can't tell where the new white is versus the old white, or at least my bad eyes can't tell. Um, but when you use the pink, it really does help. And and all of a sudden you're going, oh, I missed that little triangle there. I missed that little streak there. And you can go back and cover that up. And so it really provides that element that says, hey, here is what a good job is versus what a half-hazard job is. 
which we all need. We right? do. Because we have this uh, sense of endowment that if I did it, of course, it's going to be good. Well, it's my kids going after they go to the bathroom and washing their hands. and They feel pretty proud of themselves. They feel pretty proud. And you're going, it's been 15 seconds, maybe 10 seconds. There is no <laughs> way that you have done a good job of, of washing your hands. Go back in there. We need a hand st- we need an ink stamp for my kids is what we need. <laughs> Wash your hands so. until that ink stamp is gone. There you go. But... Th- but you think about that. There, are, you're talking about that feedback loop um, and various different things of, of what makes a good job. Just feedback in general. I mean, right. if we think about this, you can think about. So the application in and of itself is is limited, but the process of thinking through how do we make something salient for people isn't right. That's a much broader topic that you can look at and say, all right, how do we apply this in this situation? Whether that be, you know, an employee and they're doing their job, how do you make a salient feedback loop for them to understand, hey, if I am, you know, in accounting or if I am in sales or if I am in engineering, what is what are some of those salient feedback loops that you can make? Right. So in sales, there is this, you know, very mechanical and, and automatic system that's going to count activity, you know, um, or, you know, systems like salesforce.com are counting the number of emails that you send and the number of phone calls that you make. And, and there, it's, you know, it can be very number driven. But if you're in marketing or engineering or accounting, um, you might you're not going to have that uh, that very numbers driven approach, and corporations struggle with what is the appropriate uh, f- you know a feedback loop. What's the, what's an appropriate way of getting information to people who are on the front lines, maybe customer facing or not, but doing their job that they are doing a good job, they are washing their hands completely and getting all the germs off, or they're not. And I think the important piece is salient. So even going back into sales, right? So. Are emails, counting the number of emails or sales calls, are those really the key pieces of driving sales? So We know it's a factor. It can be a factor. It can be a factor, and it probably is in most situations. But is it the most salient factor, and how can we provide feedback on some of those most salient factors? Is it the way that you interact with a client? Is it the words that you use? Is it the way that you present the information? Is it the type of information that you're presenting? Are you presenting product features? Are you presenting solutions? Are you trying to really just ask questions around what is the need of the customer? There's a variety of different things. And so I think the key part here is identifying that salient component that you provide feedback on. And that doesn't always, you know, again, you could have done uh, wash your hands for 30 seconds, you know, with these people and have a timer. Um, right. But, 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 that but doesn't would it nec- have been enough? Would it have been, know, the, the, it, it's, it's, it's a measure. It's a measure, but somebody's Is it the most 30, relevant measure? Somebody's 30 second, you know, hand washing might be good. Somebody else's may not be good. So you're looking at actually what are those key components within that feedback loop that you need to do. So, so Kurt. Uh, my, my question then is back to you, c- c- kind of taking this whole feedback thing a step further. What, uh, what, what was, what's the salient feedback that you want to have for this session? <laughs> <laughs> for this session. Yeah. Ah, that's an yeah. important one. Uh, like how well are we? I don't know. I mean, what, what feedback on a podcast? There's an interesting thing. Mm. Maybe if people wrote a review, they could give us some salient feedback. Oh. I would love that. <laughs> Coach us. Good or bad. Guide right? us. There you go. Yes, yeah. So, but one of the other pieces that I thought was just fascinating when he was talking about BMW and the hedonic value of trying in, tying in some of those components into the, into that BMW project. Right. Um, and I will go back to when I first graduated college and I worked for my brother-in-law and my brother-in-law, Hank did these things called ride and drives. He is a former race car driver had all this this work where he'd work with Audi or BMW or or Mercedes, whoever it was, and he'd put on ride and drives, which basically brought in um, the cars that you were trying to to look at. So Audi was the one that I worked on him with, and so they brought in all their 
their their cars. But then they brought in cars from the competition. So you had a BMW, you had a Mercedes, you had an Acura back in the day. And we ran them through a variety of different things on the racetrack. And so with, with customers in the car. With customers in the car. These were actually salespeople. Oftentimes they're um, reporters. So from the, you know, trade magazines and various different things that they want to get new, introducing right. a new car, you do that. But we had all of the competition. So we had a drag race. We had a, we had a slalom course. We had a wet turn. Um, and then we had some other, other things going on there. And they would drive these cars, and then they'd drive the, the opponent's car, the, the competitor's car. And what was really interesting is my brother-in-law would talk to me. He goes, you know, a couple months ago, you know, we're doing this project for Audi right now. A couple months ago, he was doing a similar thing for BMW. In the way that they talk about the car with the person that is in the car with them is different. So, for instance, the wet curve, right? You go around the wet curve and, you know, if you're driving a BMW, the back end fishtails out a bit. Right. right, because it because because that's the way the car is built. That's the way the car is built. It's a it's it's that. So in the in the Audi experience, Audis are all wheel drives. At least at the time they were. I'm not sure if they still are, but you go through the wet curve and you didn't have that. So if you're doing the Audi pro, uh, program, Hank and his team would talk about. Wow, doesn't this feel you're in control? Wouldn't it be great if your, you know, your 16 year old daughter's driving this car? Wouldn't you feel safe? And then when they get in the BMW and the same thing, oh my gosh, if if you feel that wish tail, fish tail, oh, is that? Think about that. Reverse that, and you're doing the BMW program. And now when they talk about the fish tail of the BMW, they go, this is what we do when we're driving, when we're race car driving, right? You're trying to get that back end aligned so it's straight down the road, so you can accelerate faster out of the curve. The, the the component, the actual component is the same, but how you talk about it is different to reveal the salient components of, of what you're trying to sell for the product. Well, and part of this is, as Sam talked about, the intangible value of the brand. Yes. Right? This is, this is reinforcing that experience of now what it's like to be behind the wheel or to be in the car and to be feeling this. And the talk track that goes with it is... is is um, lining up and sewing together the experience with the uh, impression that that the brand wants to leave on you. Consuming the brand. Consuming the brand. Right. And yes. so it, that component. You smelling talked about, the brand. Smelling the brand, as you said. That's part of you know in in the beer component that he talked about. Right. That was there. And I think it's really interesting. Uh, I mean, I've only driven a Porsche every couple times in my life, but every time I'm in there, and it's a really hard ride. It's not. It's not it's the stiff. smooth. It's yeah. stiff, and it's this. And I'm going. This is really, wow. It's not a luxury kind of thing, but that's their brand, right? Because <laughs> yes, that means yes. you have this tight control, and and it's all of these things. It isn't meant to be a Mercedes Benz ride. It is meant to be something different, and so. That brand, that's appropriate for it. Right. And so you're consuming that. You're consuming, what did you call it? The haptic, right? The- yeah, yeah. There's that, uh, this, this experience when we, when we feel things, when we're, getting, uh, when we're getting feedback through our bodies, that's a haptic response. Uh, much like our, uh, when our phone vibrates, right? Or, or actually even better, when we touch something on our phone and it vibrates, that's a, that's a haptic response. Yeah, and so you think about that in in automobiles, it's it's definite, right? You feel how smooth the ride is, yeah. how how the steering wheel feels in your hand, all of those things. It's noticeably different from brand to brand. It is noticeably different, and I, so I've been driving minis for ten years, the the mini brand, and when I first started driving them, it was like driving a Porsche. Uh, uh, well, I, I should say this in terms of its bumpiness. <laughs> was, wow! It was the, a you know we're we're not trying to get Mini as a as an advertiser, but hey, if you want somebody to talk about, you know, Tim is here. He's your real life example. It just had that that rigid, uh, very much in tune with the with the road experience, uh, and then uh, in you know the early 2010s, they changed that. And okay, the, and and the brand started moving more towards uh, a more luxurious ride, smoother, and that turned a lot of people off. That oh. that disassociated because 
in, in you know, a lot of uh, a lot of consumers because in those consumers' mind, the brand was that haptic experience. That when I drive a mini, I'm going to feel the road. It's going to be like a go kart, right? Not a luxury car. Uh, go kart might be a better yeah. example when you think about a mini. <laughs> yes. But I think going back to the beer, right, and going back to the wine experience about how you know you actually experience the wine based on prior expectations based that, on label brand uh how it's served the environment that it's served in a whole variety of things that have very little to do with the actual taste of the wine itself right. and the impact that that has then on our actual consumption and enjoyment of that consumption or satisfaction however you want to call it right the utility as our as the economist in me will say mm -hmm. is is really dependent upon a number of factors outside of the actual product and the product qualities and features in and of itself and so again you think about the components and oftentimes we talk about those features and benefits in a sales position going back yeah. into our sales talk and oftentimes we have to think about the brand and identifying the brand above and beyond those features um, because that's not the real consumption. The real consumption is all of these other factors that come around it. These intangibles. The intangibles. Yeah. Yeah. So the behavioral grooves brand, I mean, it's the intangibles are, you know, a whole bunch of other things beyond your voice and my voice and how stupid or, or dumb our questions are. <laughs> I was thinking luxury yachts in the Mediterranean. I was thinking, you know, Harvard, uh, MBAs, you know, PhD yeah. oh. kind of going <laughs> well above that. <laughs> the insights that you're getting are, you know, better than that. So, well, we'll just have to let the listeners decide on that. Uh, what about um, the great discussion on unconscious hiring biases? Oh yeah. So talk about GI Joe fallacy, right? This this whole being aware of our of our biases doesn't even get close to actually helping us overcome them. Right. You know, we have to actually put in place certain behavioral uh, nudges or uh, guides in order to make sure that we're doing a good job of of hiring in a way that that, that uh, well that we we try to reduce the bias right in our hiring. And certainly, uh, Sam pointed this out, but I don't think emphasize it enough that. Uh, getting back to the diversification heuristic, that companies just so benefit, teams benefit from having a wide variety of, of different types of people on teams and in companies. Different perspectives really add value. And when we're hiring one at a time, it's so easy to get into the like me. I want that hiring to be like me. And I've you know, I've been in um, hiring position, positions where I've hired many people over the years and have absolutely been aware of that sometimes and not aware of it sometimes. And yet when I looked at my teams, I would say, oh, it looks like I'm, <laughs> I'm suffering from the diversification, a lack of diversification, because <laughs> there's a lot of people who look like me. <laughs> yeah, look and sound like you. Yeah. I, it's, it's interesting. I was reading some George Lowenstein on sequencing. Right, and the power of sequencing and some work that he's done on that, which, again, falls into this, right, to, to that degree um, in looking at how we, we like a sequence or don't like a sequence on, um, you know, where economically speaking, if you got $1,000 today, $500 tomorrow, $250 day three, yeah. right? That doesn't seem as as good as getting $250 today, $500 tomorrow, and maybe even not $1,000 day three, but like $900 day three, where you're actually getting less. But we don't like that, we, right? We, the sequence we, matters. The sequence matters. Going back into the component of thinking about hiring, right? And we... We're looking at this from a perspective of, hey, do we hire one-offs or do we hire in a group? And that, that component of being able to actually take that larger picture perspective changes how we view each of the people within there. And so it's not this necessary sequential component. It's not these other elements. Yeah. It goes back into also, um, you know, I think a little bit about when we were talking with uh, Linnea Gandhi. Linnea. Yeah. Linnea Gandhi. Sorry. Sorry, Linnea. Um, 
uh, in just in her conversation about like even grading papers and you look at a really good paper and the subsequent person that you're the paper that you're looking at is reflective back on that because you're going to probably compare it to that one right in advance of it. But in fact, both are really good papers. And so if you're hiring in, in, in large amounts, you're looking at this and going, oh, well, of the entirety, these two are really good. Whereas yeah. if you would have looked at them differently, that And that's really been, hard to do. That's yeah. very, very difficult uh, to, for us to do. But it's better. It is better. Are we, are we at the end, Tim? Is this done? Are we are we well, gone? I was I was hoping that we could close out. I was uh, hoping on on music. How I so love that that you just jumped right into it. I didn't have to say a thing. Yeah, yeah. You, you, I I just have a feeling that that's where we end up. <laughs> So we're, we're so this is uh, the last episode that we are recording uh, in 2018. So musical highlights from 2018. What mm. what what shows did you see? What what new music did you encounter? What what was a musical experience that happened in 2018 that is vivid for you and that, and that is wanna, vivid for me? Yeah, that you want to call out. Um, so I will have to go. Uh, um, to Julius, uh, Julia and Angus Stone. Uh, the, we talked about this a couple times, but I did see them in concert. Yes, I saw you two in concert, but I saw I would I would rate the you know the big stadium U two concert versus Julia and Angus Stone in in this fine line of Minneapolis as a much more enjoyable show for me. And just uh, really digging into their music, I've, I've been listening to them for a couple of years, but this was the year where they just kind of dominated my musical listening. Uh, components this year. How, yeah. about, how about for you? Uh, I had a trip to Nashville this summer mm-hmm. and uh, got to see just some some tremendous uh, songwriters and tremendous talent. But it the trip overall reminded me of the importance that Amer- Americana style music, not country music, but Americana, which I'm going to describe as being derivative of of a little bit of country, a little bit of folk, a little bit of rock. A little bit of jazz, a little bit of blues, really kind of all the American uh, systems of music coming together in, in in something with all these influences. That Americana is really on the rise, and there are really great writers and performers uh, coming forward in in Americana. So I that that's kind of my big takeaway is that Americana is on the rise, and which appeals to me because I've never felt that it's worth having allegiance to just one one style. Okay. It's like to say, Oh, I'm only into, you know, a uh, hair metal bands or I'm only in, I, I know which, which you might be, but, uh, but no, it's you're, just cause they have hair and I'm like <laughs> jealous of that but, beautiful hair. But, but I just think that, uh, that, uh, talk about uh, diversification, yeah. you know, that when you bring all of these together, that's what, that's what makes music really interesting for me. There's some interesting synergies when you're bringing in disparate components, right? And sometimes it works, and it can work really, really well. And other times it doesn't work at all, and and you can have some really disasters when you're trying to bring that in. But I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So with that, happy 2018. Welcome 2019, 2019. or whenever you listen to this. Who knows? This will be out there for Lord knows how long. So thank you everybody for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, keep on grooving. Keep on grooving.